Welcome while you're at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family, and we are delighted to be welcomed into your home. We certainly would love to hear from you, so please send us an email with a question or a comment to Jim and Joy at EWTN.com. And today, our guest for today and tomorrow will be Connor Gallagher. He is the CEO of Tan Books, and he's the author of several books, including Still Amidst the Storm, and Parenting for Eternity. And both of these great mm -hmm. books are at EWTNRC.com. And happy Feast of the Angels today, all the beautiful angels. It's Wednesday. That's right. And we love our angels. <laughs> we pray to our angels. Yeah. And um, we know that all that so much happens in this yeah. world because of their force and their power and their mm -hmm. presence, so and, thank God. And Connor has a whole chapter, Connor, yeah. mm -hmm. on, on, on angels and the demonic realm as well as angels that are, are with our Lord and for us. But I just wanted to mention in terms of his book, Parenting for Eternity, A Guide to Raising Children in Holy Mother Church, what a great word, a prophetic word for this age and for this time. On Sunday, we heard from Father Bede, who filled yes. in for Father Jerebic. Father, Father Bede is a, is a monk up in Coleman, Benedictine monk, and he, he just taught on that passage um, you know, of the gospel. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands and to go into Gehenna, into the unquenchable fire. If it's your foot, cut off your foot. If it's your eye, take your eye out. And so he spoke about this, and he, and he, and he said, you know, we speak about this as hyperbole and exaggeration and all likelihood it is, but it's, it's a very serious matter, he was saying, and that we can't take tritely sin mm. because you could wind up in hell, basically yes. is what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if you believe in hell, Jesus is warning you, don't, don't, don't make a clean break with everything that's evil. Mm -hmm. If it's your eye, if it's your hand, if it's your whatever, because if you're in hell or even go through purgatory and, and the love of God, you'll be saying, it would have been better if I took my eye out. And so we're not telling you to do any of that, the eye and cut, cut your limbs off. But Jesus is saying, this is very serious. And mm -hmm. Khan is saying that in Parenting for Eternity. That's right. Because both priests and parents are shepherds of a flock. And, and Khan is doing what the priest was doing to us as members of a congregation. And Khan is doing this for parents and saying, you have to see your life and your children from eternity mm. in here. And are we really preparing them for this? If not, we need to get on with it. We need to live it. We need to teach our children because God wants us to be happy. And you can't be truly happy if you're compromising w with sin, mm -hmm. if you're loving the world and the things of this world. And so it's a, it's a wonderful book. Uh, we want you to stay with us. There's plenty more to come. Don't go away. Welcome back, lawyer well, at home with Jim and Joy. And today our guest is Connor Gallagher. He is the CEO of Tan Books. He's the author of several books, including Still Amidst the Storm mm -hmm. and Parenting for Eternity. And both of these books are available at EWTNRC.com. Well, Connor, we welcome you to At Home, and we were delighted to have read your books. And um, first, we want you to tell our family a little bit about you. And then, did having 15 children influence mm -hmm. you in writing this book, in parenting for eternity? It's a great pleasure to be with you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm truly honored and humbled. Um, so yes, I'm the CEO of Tan Books, uh, honored to lead this great company, trying to publish books that help people become saints. Um, but more importantly, I'm, I'm a husband to Ashley Gallagher, love of my life, um, who converted to Catholicism at 17 years old, uh, probably never expecting to have uh, 15 children with anybody, <laughs> especially me, but that's, that's what happened. And so, yeah, the, we have 15 kids. The oldest is almost 20, and the, the new one, the, the youngest one is, well, we'll be here in January. That's number 15. So the baby's one, and she's spoiled, and she'll be booted out of the baby seat uh, in a few more months. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the way it goes. So, no, we have a very happy, joyful life. I'm, I'm very blessed in many areas. And so, um, 
you know, when you have 15 kids, though, to answer your question, I think what happens is you realize you have such a limited time with each child and you have limited money and you have limited resources. I remember, you know, at one point we had six different baseball teams going at one time or something mm -hmm. to that effect. And it was like, this is impossible. We, we can't we can't keep doing this like people do with two or three kids. It's just impossible, you know. Um, so uh, you start thinking, OK, what's truly important here? I don't I cannot do what other parents do with two or three kids. So mm -hmm. what does a parent with 15 do, you know, or eight or 10 or, you know, whatever massive number there is. And so it, upon reflection, I really started saying, I need to spend a little bit of time I have with each of my kids each day uh, talking about God, talking about salvation, talking about heaven and hell, talking about death. And, you know, I, I just cannot give each of my children the same amount of time as a parent of one kid does. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I try to make those conversations really count. And it causes you to reflect deeply on what is the most important things to communicate to your child. And that, I think, were the seeds that led to uh, writing this book. Yeah. The main point is I want my kids to understand they are immortal creatures mm. and that they are going to be here for eternity. And I am raising them for heaven, not for Harvard. Yes, yes, there you go. And we used to tell our kids that too, you know, like when they would say, well, they get to do this and this family gets to do this and in the church, you know, and I would say, you know, well, hats off to those parents. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing, but we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And my job is to give you God's heart and to raise you for heaven um, because this this is temporary, you know? And so all the things, and I, it's so hard as you recognized, we were in six different baseball teams and, you know, doing all this stuff and you're running mad and you're out of breath and it's and it, it becomes berserk. It's like, we can't do this. And what is the most important thing? And you got that and you authored this great book. It reminds me that, of that scripture that speaks about that, uh, you know, physical exercise is of, of value, mm -hmm. you know, in this life. But the spiritual exercise is of value not only in this life, but in the age to come. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that's, that's your focus, that we have to live in the now, as you say in one of your books. Uh, live in the now. Uh, you don't want to focus so much on, you know, what might be coming in the future. But in terms of eternal things, we need to be thinking about those mm -hmm. things because what we're doing now affects eternity. Your eternity as a parent, you're going to be held accountable for what you modeled and what you taught. I don't think you're accountable for your child's decision. Every child has to make that decision. Every person does. But you're accountable for the good food that you're giving your little mm -hmm. sheep and your lambs. And that goes on to all eternity. And you will be judged for that. So that's what I hear the focus of your book to be about. Yes, well, you know, I, 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 you know, it's interesting that the gospel reading yesterday had to do with a millstone being tied around your neck and cast into the depths of the sea, and it's just providential that I'm here talking to you today. That is the wake-up call. Jesus Christ gave us parents the wake-up call, you know. And I have to think, you know, most parents, including myself, was like, "Well, I'm not leading my kids astray, mm -hmm. but are we? How in our our, uh, you know, example, you know, so if my kids catch me early morning saying my prayers or sleeping in, that's leading them in one way or another. Mm -hmm. If they catch me in having a bad tone of voice, you know, uh, arguing with them or, you know, being less than charitable or patient, that's setting an example. So I think the wake up call is to parents to, to show them you Every single thing you do has eternal consequence for your children because you're setting an example. And the passage in Scripture yesterday was the most important passage of all for parents because you don't have to just think about bad people who are influencing your children. You are influencing your children in good and bad ways every day, and that is your judgment. And so I've been really trying to reflect on that. And it's a wake-up call to other parents, but first and foremost, it's a wake-up call to me. i got to get mm -hmm. this right. I only get one chance to do right. this, yeah. only mm -hmm. one chance. Yeah. In your introduction, you say, all your efforts to save the little heart that pumps blood, but so little effort to save the soul that lives forever. How often have you darted across the room to save your toddler from ingesting a dangerous chemical, but shrugged your shoulders at the impurity on streaming video mm -hmm. or the wrath of video games? How often have you sat on pins and needles awaiting your new driver to return home safely but think little about his soul crashing into the drags of humanity mm. on his smartphone. 
Yeah, I tell you what, folks. I mean, you raise kids. You know what it's like. You know what it's like, uh, you know, helping a little kid who's choking on something or you know, a big kid who's driving home for the first. These are normal, everyday experiences. And you're not a good parent if you're not worried about this world and this body. Mm -hmm. But how much of your time are you focused on eternity? Right. You know, the, the influences on your children are far worse than than potential, you know, physical dangers. And I just think that we have to have that wake up call to say, you know, are we going to be focused on the soul more than the body? I mean, that's what Jesus, you know, he that's what he spends the entire yeah. gospels mm -hmm. telling us about yeah. is focus on the soul. Don't worry so much about what that which yeah. can hurt the body, but worry about that which can hurt the soul. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm trying to tell parents, even if it's a vivid image, even if it's a little intimidating for them to process that, yeah. I think parents need to hear that. Yeah. yeah, I'm reminded of the words of our, our Lord who says, you know, don't fear him who can kill your body, but fear him who can take your body and your soul and place it in hell. Nobody, nobody can do that except the Lord, the, you know, to, to say the ultimate thing is about me. And that's why we have saints that, that uh, love the Lord even unto death. Well, you start out your book, you, yes. know, you start your book with the four um, last things. Um, you go right to it. And the, the importance of, of having to deal with and our children having to know and about death mm -hmm. and about judgment, judgment <laughs> and about heaven and, mm -hmm. and hell. So you begin right there. Speak to us more fully about why you chose that and how you might present that uh, to, to our children. I, I think the modern world has done us a tremendous disservice and kind of hiding kind of those scary aspects mm -hmm. from people, you know, and, and we're raising an entire generation of wimps um, only thinking about the rosy things. You know, no, I want to raise my children with a very real sense that death is a part of life. Mm -hmm. And also mm -hmm. that, that this life is not completely separate from eternity. It's one life. I don't have two lives. Mm -hmm. I have one life. I have one here on earth and one hopefully in heaven or hell, but hopefully heaven. And, and so I want my kids to understand that judgment and death are part of that. And heaven and hell are the only yeah. possible two ultimate destinations. I'm going to be very direct with them because whether I teach them math and science and reading and all the other studies that they have to go through, if I don't teach them those ultimate last things, yeah. I have failed them. I have right. failed them. Mm -hmm. and, you know, children are, they're thinking about death. Um, and they're intrigued by it. And, you know, recently we had one of our 17 grandchildren who, uh, you know, their cat that they really, you know, love in a certain way. Well, anyway, it got killed. And that was really traumatic. Mm -hmm. But this, you know, and so then my son had to speak to him about death of, of animals. And there's death with human beings as well. And, you know, we age in that this is a natural part of life, that we're, we're going to die unless the Lord comes back and takes us to himself. And so we, we took James to, to Mass with us, That's, and he said, you know, Nona, I know that you have some people that are, are buried out by your church. Can I, can I see that? And so we took him to see some of the, the graves and, and also the where, columbarium. The columbarium where the ashes are there, and we spoke about all this, but he wanted to know about that, and it gives mm. us opportunity to speak about Yes, Nona and Babo are, are going to, to die, and, and that's a little bit sad, so on, but we're, we're looking forward to eternity, and, and, to, and we want you to be there with us, and this is how we apply ourselves to God's grace and the gifts he gives us through the sacraments and cooperating with that, and to have these conversations. I mean, kids are thinking about this. Mm -hmm. Things are dying, even though we try to avoid death, whether it's people or animals or whatever. So what's going on? And not, let the, not to let them have, be unduly fearful about these things, but to address these things and to say that we are a people of hope and, and to, to, to preach with, with fire, that mm -hmm. Christ has conquered sin and death and sickness. We don't deny these things, but we're more than victors in Christ Jesus who's won the battle for us. That's why we're going to Mass. That's why we're, Nona and Babo are uh, making sure you do your devotion in the morning while you're staying with us and so on. Your thoughts on that? Uh, you said it better than I could, you know, but death is all around and we live on a little farm and whether it's, you know, the watermelon and, mm -hmm. you know, spoils out in the garden or the chickens die, our chickens recently. Um, so, you know, death is a part of our life and we want our children to have not a, not a shock when death occurs around them because it will, if they live long enough, they're going to have death around them. Okay. Well, you All know, right. I, one of the things that we did with our children, um, for the good and bad of it, and we were just figuring it out as we went, one of the things that 
we had our children working in a soup kitchen. And Jim used to be an Episcopal priest, and he, um, we fed 150 people every single day for 15 years. And so the kids went into the soup kitchen where they saw that people were poor, that there wasn't always an abundance of food in the refrigerator, so that they could get God's heart. And what was our response to people's suffering as opposed to saying, I don't even know that people are suffering. And so we really tried to put our faith in action with the reality of people being poor, people being hungry, um, people being homeless, and so that they could see and cultivate God's heart in the midst of that, and which is so important for our children, and not only here on earth, but but in eternity, that you yes. want to love and feed this person, yes. that you would you would be Jesus to them. In the, uh, when did I see you naked yeah. and give me clothes? When did I know that you were hungry and you fed me? It's us. We should be able to do that, right? So kind In of, this life now. Can you speak to that? Well, Raising up children that see Jesus Christ in the least and our responsibility in the final judgment being, I was, I was hungry, I was naked, and, and so on. You did this to me. Oh, man, you know, I have this little saying with my kids. I say, okay, they're fighting over something. I say, who's going to be my peacemaker right now? Mm -hmm. And then they say, it's his turn to be a peacemaker, you know? So, you know, trying, trying to let them see that we are, uh, f we are seeing Christ in others in big ways and small ways. Why? Because this other person you're, you're, you're treating, your brother, your sister, your enemy, mm -hmm. your friend, mm -hmm. these are eternal creatures as well. And yeah. you're going to spend eternity with them or without them. It's your job to take them with you. So I always try to push the etern eternal aspect mm -hmm. of the people they're dealing with. You know, if you tell them, you're, 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 you're picking on your brother, you're picking on one of God's children mm -hmm. who's eternal. Mm -hmm. And just that, that's a bigger deal than just picking on your brother. Yeah. Right. And, I, and in families, you can say, well, I, I hate him right now, or I hate her right now, and I hate their behavior. And then that's a way to cultivate holiness in their own hearts. Now, speaking yes. of holiness in their own hearts, tell our family the great influence that parents have um, like if all of our phones started pinging and dinging that Jesus was in at our local church, wouldn't we all just run down, right? And we would want to go before the Blessed Sacrament and see him and be with him. Mm -hmm. How much of an influence are the parents on teaching adoration to their children and just their own prayer life and the, their mannerisms in the sanctuary? Well, it's a wonderful question because... You know, I, I think it, good catechesis comes natural to me. It's easy for me to teach my children the, the teachings of the faith, but it is not natural for me to, to show them, teach them piety through my own uh, virtue, you know. And so once I realized that the greatest catechism was not the big fat green book, mm -hmm. it was actually my own life and my mm -hmm. wife's life. That really shook me. You know, um, I know that my children are looking at me when I'm at mass and physically, am I reverent? Am I, um, what is my facial expression? You know, I talk to my kids about body language, when, especially when they're talking to their mom, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, what's my body language when I approach our Lord yes. in, in, in adoration? And so they're watching. And so just, you know, again, having so many kids, it makes me realize do I treat the Eucharist, especially in front of my children, the way I'm supposed to? They're mm. learning from me, good and mm. bad. When we pray the rosary every night, man, I like I lay down on the couch sometimes, get real comfy, pray the rosary. I need to beef up my piety big time. You know, I'm kind of sloppy like that. And so writing this really reflecting on my physical piety and signs of reverence towards the sacred, yeah. especially towards the blessed Eucharist. Mm. That's a that's a big examination of conscience for me. I think parents should re, should think about that. It's not just whether you teach the kids the Ten Commandments. It's whether you worship God correctly in front of them. Mm. That's the bigger lesson. Right. Yeah. That, that gets that is really more caught than taught, isn't it? Because they're just watching and they're saying, this is how I should be. I should kneel. I should I should bow. I should this should be the way I should be as a human being. And not only that, but your spirit embodying that through your body that people are like, and then that gets contagious. All that adoration, all that love, all that desire that you want to be before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Well Connor, we're going to pick this up tomorrow, but I just want you to share a brief closing word to the family 
and the importance of, of the way we parent now, love now, and, and the result of that regarding eternity. Just a quick word. Your children are going to be here when, and with their own eyes, they're going to see the sun burn out, the galaxy turn to dust. They are eternal. And so what you do with your child today is going to affect them for eternity. Please remember that. They are going to live trillions of years. And sometimes we forget that when we have big words like eternity. Treat mm -hmm. them like they're going to live trillions of years and they'll be better off. Yes. Kind of thank you so very much. We look forward to tomorrow and hearing more about parenting for eternity, a guide to raising children in Holy Mother Church. You can go to EW10RC.com. Plenty more to come. Please don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, you know, Connor was sharing just about our posture, our way, our presence as we go into the sanctuary. And, you know, I think of a time when um, we went to Mass. It was Christmas Eve, and it was one of the first times that um, the grandchildren had come in. They were going to another parish at that time. And our little three-year-old Jude, he was three, and he came. I'll never forget his face. I'll never forget the moment. It's captured in time in my soul. And he was looking up at the cathedral and just looking around, and there was this awe, and he was just mesmerized mm. by the beauty. And it was just like the Holy Spirit like just tugged at my heart and said, I want you to come in every Sunday and look like that. And it was just like, yes. And so mm. our children are watching. Um, when you think I need to make sure they're sitting perfect in the pew and they're being obedient and... No, just make sure they capture your spirit because that is caught. When you kneel, your reverence, your spiritual beauty, they see, they want. I mean, I think of when our grandchildren come with us and they're looking at us, what we're doing and how we're being. That's covering more than any conversation can possibly cover. It's Parenting for Eternity, a guide to raising children in Holy Mother Church. This is really excellent. Are you thinking mm -hmm. about that? What are the key things I want to teach my children verbally, didactically, and in the way I live? The last four things, the virtue of piety, the virtue of humility, a sense of the complete church, reliance on our lady and the saints, awareness of the angelic and demonic, the school of Calvary, a joyous conclusion. These mm -hmm. are the things we need to pass on to our children and to share, teach them, and to model, model them before them. May God give to us, in the midst of all the teaching that we give, as Joy was sharing, the wonder of children when they see something so mysterious and so beautiful. God, restore that within us. Mm. Help us not to be so familiar. We believe in the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ and the Holy Eucharist. I hope you do. If not, you better get in line with the church yeah. um, or you're your own pope. And so if he is really there, as much as I can't take that all in, I need to kneel before the Lord, my maker. I need to be filled with the joy of the Lord that he would allow me to get this close and even to consume him for my own sake. Mm. But as you do that, your children, your grandchildren will see. Not that we're not doing it so that they see. But when they see that the joy of the Lord is my mama's strength. Yes. The joy of the Lord is my non and babo's strength. And they catch it. You catch on fire when you're sitting next to fire, not mm. by ice cubes. I became Catholic. I grew in my faith because I sat by, sat by people who were on fire. Mm. May you as a parent be on fire for Christ and for Holy Mother Church. It's the best thing you could do for your kids and for your grandkids that will live for all eternity in heaven or in hell. God bless you. God bless all of your loved ones. You're never alone. You're an important part of the EW10 family. We're all walking this through together. And God will fill us with his happiness now and the age to come. Bye now.